Good afternoon. I sincerely hope that everyone is feeling well and finding ways to stay healthy. As we enter into the holiday season, please find ways to enjoy your family and friends, do some celebrations. Uh, tis a season to be merry and bright. Our vision is our destination, where we're going and when we plan to get there. Our mission is our purpose, our goal, while we exist. It inspires us to action. Our core values are what we believe, our values drive us and motivate us to continue the course of action. I welcome students and their parents, staff, community, all board members. Special thanks again to Mr. Lowe for assisting with the technology. Today is Tuesday, December 6, 2022, and I officially call today's meeting of the Clinton City Schools Board of Education to order. Thank you again to everyone um, who make our district the best that it can be. We recognize and appreciate your hard work and dedication. Our deepest gratitude is extended to our frontline and essential workers, those who care for us and protect us. Your hard work, commitment, and dedication are recognized and appreciated. Our thoughts are also extended to our students, employees, and their families who are suffering from sickness and the loss of loved ones. We had an employee this morning who was injured in an accident. Special prayers for her and her family and for everyone who was involved in the accident. A special remembrance is requested for our city, county, state, and nation as we address all the challenges that we face today. Our students of the month and their parents will join us at 5.30 p.m. We look forward to honor, honoring them for their hard work thus far this school year. We also have students who participated in the School Board Association competition that we will honor this afternoon as well. It's hard to believe that we're nearing the end of the first semester. Many thanks to everyone for working hard every day and for making every minute of every day count. I know that excitement is in the air. Our goal is to realize our vision and our mission and to fulfill our core values every day. Let's continue to find ways to promote vitality in our schools with our students and staff and in our personal and professional lives. No matter who or what we are today, we can all be better tomorrow. We are stronger together. I will begin with a roll call. Please answer as I call your name. Mr. Clark Hales. Present. Mr. Jeremy Edgerton is not with us yet. He should be arriving shortly. Yes. Yes, I am. I'm here. Oh, he is with us. He's joining us remotely. Thank you, Mr. Edgerton. Pastor Russ Emanuel. Yes, Present. Dr. Oscar Rodriguez. He should be joining us remotely soon. Ms. Carol Worley. Present. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Worley. Our attorney, Rebecca Williams. Present. Thank you. Dr. Wesley Johnson. Present. Ms. Emily Devane. Present. Mr. John Lowe. Present. Dr. Teresa Malinas. Present. Ms. Nicole Hayes. Present. Ms. Sheila Peterson is not with us today. Oh, she's absent. Please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Next section on our agenda is public comments, and no one has registered for this session, so we'll go on to approval of the board agenda. Board members, you've had an opportunity to review the agenda. There are no revisions. I ask for a motion to accept the agenda as presented. Madam Chair, I make the motion that we accept the agenda as presented. Motion made by Pastor Emmanuel. Can I get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hales. All in favor, let it be known by the word aye. 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 Do you hear Carol? Yes, aye. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Opposes have the same right. Motion carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Again, you've had an opportunity to review the consent agenda. There are several items on that agenda. I need a motion to approve the consent agenda as it's presented. Madam Chair, I make the motion we approve consent agenda as presented. Motion made by Mr. Uh, Hales. Can I get a second? Second. Second. 
second by Patsy Emanuel. I think I heard him first. All in favor, let it be known by the word aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed to have the same right. Motion carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Dr. Malinas, Instructional Services. Good afternoon, board, Madam Chair. I um, would like to welcome up Sampson Middle School, and they will be presenting their school improvement plan for your approval this afternoon. Thank you, Sampson Middle. Good evening. Good evening. I'll start us off. Um, first of all, we thank God that we came out of low performance um, and we're trying to stay out of low performance. But we have identified a few things that we need to work on to strengthen um, what we have to do. So our first um, goal one, if you please, if you would, John. Our first goal, our improvement goal is by 2024, we want to increase our overall grade level proficiency in reading to 54%. Uh, last year, our reading percentage was 50.8%. So we're going to tell you some things later on how we're going to strengthen that. So our goal is for 54% for this year. And of course, they give the math person the math code. So by 2024, we're going to increase our overall grade level proficiency to 57%. We were or are currently at 53.5. So we feel like that move to 57 will, percent will be doable. And then the third goal, of course, covers our students with disabilities. Um, and, and it's still a small number. Uh, we would like to increase our overall grade level proficiency to 20% at the end of the 21-22 school year, that um, proficiency level was 18.3 for our students with disabilities. And ways that we're going to try to, to improve us action step for goal one, um, as we said earlier, by 2024, we're gonna uh, have a profi uh, proficiency level at 54%, which was currently at 50.8. Um, action steps, we're gonna do universal implementation of 30 minutes of intervention and our I needs, what we call it, based on the student's need. Um, we're doing that now. We're doing pretty good, not exactly where I want us to be, but we're still working to get there. Resources needed is gonna be I-ready diagnostic, what we use to govern it by, and the middle of the year, and EOG scores. Uh, persons uh, responsible, all person on deck, all hands on deck, that's including our resource teachers as well. Um, evaluation measures, we're gonna look at our rate of progress and monitoring data. And that's gonna go to 2022, 20, 23, and 24. Universal implementation of ANR school-wide, um, our rate of diagnostic and um, MOY is what we're using for resources. Uh, person responsible is primarily our ELA teachers, but I have had some resource teachers to ask if they could participate, I said, sure. The more the merrier. Um, evaluation measures, we're going to do our ready progress monitoring data and our AR goal setting measurement, and that's going to run up to 2024. Um, the third one, academic resource and ESL teacher working with targeted audience, um, explored during the exploratory box, which is going to be the resource needed. Uh, person responsible, academic resource teachers and ESL teacher. We are down one ESL teacher, but we have a long-term sub in our current ESL teachers doing a great job at providing her information to give to those students. Um, and that is going to be up to the, out to the 2024 school year. And then after school tutoring, we're going to use our I-ready diagnostic and MOY as well as EOG scores um, resource for the resource needed. And person responsible going to be teachers, all teachers. We won't have all teachers doing um, uh, remediation, but we're going to have a vast uh, amount and good teachers that are um, good in their subject areas, especially in the areas that we are struggling with. Um, we go evaluation measure, we're going to use I ready progress and marching data, and that'll be out to the spring of 2023. For math, we have three action steps. 
And our first one is piggybacking off our goal to action step, which is our IE block every day for 30 minutes that all students participate in. Students are leveled based on their already diagnostic, and depending on what they need, that's what they concentrate on. Um, the middle of the nine weeks, we flip. Um, for instance, on my team, I'm a two person team, so they do ELA if that is something for half the semester and then they do math for the other half and then we have some that are in enrichment as opposed to intervention um, that requires us to use things that we have on hand like our already diagnostics even looking at their past eog scores um, all teachers are responsible for this block um, we send our enrichment um, teachers items that the kids can work on that they are able to best help those kids with. And we're evaluating it by our iReady progress and actually monitoring the kids because at any time we can pull in an enrichment kid that may need help with something back to an intervention group. And we'll continue that for the rest of this year and next year. Our second action step is working with our ESL population. Um, that happens in their exploratory block, Ms. Korea's pools that group of students to work with them then and we're going to continue that into the rest of this year and next year also our third action step is using our after school tutoring program to pull those mid right now we're focused on the middle kids um, we had a cohort just start in november and we're working with that cohort and trying to build it um, we use the iReady data to invite kids to that tutoring targeting those kids um, not all teachers are involved with this, but it's certain teachers on each grade level. Um, we use their already data. Well, we'll use their already data to decide, you know, if it's time to like gradually release them or keep them in the program. It says spring of 2023, but we already got a jump start on it. For our goal three, our students with disabilities, we're using some of the same tools you've already heard in the um, action steps on the first two. Um, since within the special education program, we already have a targeted reading intervention for those students with uh, direct reading goals, we are focusing our INE time on math because we don't have a second math intervention like the Language Live program we use in reading. So those kids come to the seventh graders come to me four days a week that we focus directly on math. And then that fifth day, we roll it into a, an enrichment type class so that they're getting the advantage of, of not just drilling math every day of the week. Um, we, um, of course, like I said, we're using INE um, for students with reading goals. We do have the Language Alive program. This is the sixth or seventh year that we've used that program. We see some mixed results with that but we do see growth overall with our kids there after school um, tutoring is also going to be available in the spring um, and then they will be invited based upon um, where their scores fall and then um, in that math and INE I &E block that we're doing we're using MobyMax as a um, as an intervention strategy um, one of the areas we have found is many of these students um, with math disabilities don't know some of the basic multiplication tables. And so we're drilling those really hard, trying to build that automaticity in that area. And then from that, adding to focus on what they're doing in class to, to try to give them a little bit more support in that area as well. When the um, school leadership team developed this plan, we did create a two-year plan. Um, we do know that we may meet those growth goals this year and if we do next year next year's school leadership team can come in they can amend these goals and they can grow them beyond that but we felt um for the for this year we wanted to have a two-year goal in place to give us a, a target to work for i don't think i formally introduce my team this is mr king he's one of our chairs and this is Miss Everett is the co-chair and I'm Mr. Faison. Are there any questions for us? Mr. Faison, how many days a week are you tutoring? I heard um, Mr. King said they were tutoring four days a week. What about the other tutoring program? 
I got you. Okay. So math after school is two days a week. Um, it is Mondays and Thursdays from around, well, the kids are in the hallway with us at like 2.45, so we get started. They start on already. So from 2.45 until 3.15. And Dr. Brunson, let me clarify for what I was talking about targeting those seventh graders in math. Um, that is during that I and E block. It's, it's not additional tutoring. And ELA tutoring won't start until the spring. Yep. So how many students are currently in the Monday and Thursday group, Miss Everett? There's probably about across all three grade levels, about 40. I think the sixth grade group is the biggest. The seventh and eighth group is combined or both the two of the seventh grade teachers are taking one has the eighth graders, one has the seventh graders. Do they have transportation or are they? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, that was one of the things that bits of information we collected was whether bus transportation was needed. So the bus is here promptly at 415, takes them, drops them off. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Brunson, that program is PRC 189. It is specific for math grades four through eight. And so um, we run, we manage that. Um, Ms. Sneed, who's our math curriculum specialist, helps run that. Um, students were invited based on uh, beginning of the year iReady assessment data. We invited many more than are here, but those are the ones that, that we reached out to and, and were able to come. And so the transportation is provided. They do get a snack after school. And so that money is provided through um, PRC 189. And from my understanding, Dr. Molina, is that we can't add on as, if we need to as we go mm -hmm. along. There, have... There's money. So okay. if you want to turn that 40 into 80, as okay. long as you have the students, we can get you the teachers and the teachers agree to, to do that, then yeah, absolutely. Okay, so there's the there's money there. We've got about seven, there was about $69,000 in that pot of money. So okay. that'll, that'll take us for okay. the rest of year. So. I have a question. Move it, I can't hear me. Let me see. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, you said you invited many, many more students. And um, what are, is, is there anything in place for those students who didn't come? Or are we doing anything to try to um, encourage or motivate them to participate? Did we find out why the others didn't participate? We, you want to let you go first. Okay. Go. We have, um, <laughs> we're going to provide in the spring of the year, uh, math and ELA. Uh, mm -hmm. for those that couldn't come for the uh, fall of the year. Um, and we're always telling them that, you know, we're doing tutoring, so if they want to come, they can come. That's why I asked Dr. Malini, it's about uh, adding on as we go. I had some parents to call me, uh, so we can add on as we go. And I'll follow up. Um, that's how we got our number to 40. Um, mm -hmm. We've been continuously talking to the kids, calling parents. Um, I've been on the phone numerous times going this is what your child needs can you please sign the paper and send it back um because we have to have that transportation piece mm -hmm. for sure um that's the biggest thing is how they're going to get home because we don't want anybody left after school so that's a continual process for us because every week um especially in sixth grade we sit down and talk about who do we need to bring in so we'll just keep continuing harassing children until we get them in <laughs> I was just curious to, to know, you know, for those parents, when you're speaking to them about what, you know, this is what their, their students needing, what, what are the things, the resistance, you know, if it's transportation, well, you have an option for transportation, you have an answer for that. So um, I was just curious as to the resistance that you're receiving from parents and how we might be able to address it if, if it's, if we could. Thank I you. Think I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I think mm -hmm. for some of the kids, some of the kids are overscheduled. Uh -huh. We got to think about some of our kids are in soccer, dance, you name it. That's mm -hmm. the biggest problem. Um, we've been trying to communicate that we have transportation if you can't get here. But also some of our kids go home and they're taking care of younger kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have to remember that like we might have programs, but these kids have other obligations that don't pertain to school that we also have to think about. Very good. Thank you so much.
other questions or comments from the just board? a comment we're very proud of the middle school with the improvement in the test score so. continue to try to make you proud any other comments or questions from the Sampson middle school team thank you mr king Ms. everett mr Faison, for sharing your school improvement plan I've got a quick comment, Dr. Brunson. Okay. Uh, many of the uh, teachers and principals that you'll see tonight, uh, they go over and above and beyond the call of duty. There's going to be several of them in here tonight that go up, go over and above beyond the call of duty. Uh, just recently, I had the opportunity, as well as Dr. Brunson, to sit with Principal Faison on his dissertation proposal at Gardner Webb University. <laughs> I could not be more proud of Tony uh, than I was in that presentation. Uh, he did an excellent job, and I look forward to continually to work with him. And uh, soon uh, it'll be uh, Dr. Faison. We're most proud of you. Uh, Principal Faison, uh, he has he 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 uh, was approved to move forward with his research, uh, as well uh, with Mr. King. Uh, Mr. King has been able to uh, assist us this year. We're still down an EC position here at the at the school. We we we're making the hire, uh, and we're just waiting on uh, a young lady to come over from Butler Avenue, who's going to be in that EC position. She's here, She's She's here now. Uh -huh. Well, that's fantastic. We'll be staff we'll be next Monday. Staff. Yep. And, and so he's been filling in and doing extra duties as well as Everett did. I believe last year uh, she filled in during a teacher absence well, the whole year, basically. And so you're going to see that with many of the teachers that are in here. I'll say the same about our high school when they come up. But just kudos to the extra effort that our this group is doing and uh, many of our teachers around uh, Clinton City Schools. Thank you. Thank you all and everybody at Sampson Middle School for all your hard work. Um, we need to approve the Sampson Middle School um, School Improvement Team before we move on. So board members, if you have no more questions or comments, I'll uh, ask for a motion to approve the Sampson Middle School School Improvement Plan as presented. Madam Chair, I make the motion. I'll make that Mr. Edgerton, you're coming in just a little bit late, okay? <laughs> Pastor Russ made the motion. Would you like to make the second, Mr. Edgerton? That's fine. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We have a motion by Pastor Emmanuel and second by Mr. Edgerton. All in favor, let it be known by the word aye. 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 Thank you, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Motion carried. Dr. Brunson. Yes, sir. I believe Dr. Malanis. I was just going to introduce you. Oh. Okay, Clint High School. Good. Good afternoon, I'm Susan Westerbeek, the principal at Clinton High School. With us today, we have Ms. Sabrina Reeves, our math teacher, and Ms. Ashley Slater, our EC teacher. She's also department chair, and they both um, chair and vice chair our SIT team. So we are glad to have them with us presenting. Uh, so our three goals that we're actually having for our school improvement um, uh, team this year. Uh, so our goal one is during the two, uh, 2022 uh, 23 school year, all ninth graders are going to show one, gra uh, one grade level of growth after completing uh, a personalized learning path in English and in math. Our goal two is we're going to be providing additional inclusion support for prerequisite EOC courses um, and EOC courses during the 22-23 school year for our students with disabilities to ensure that they meet or exceed growth expectations. And then goal three is a repeat, if I'm not mistaken, correct. Uh, we actually decided to keep last year's goal and we wanted to continue with that this year. So we want 70% of all students will meet or exceed state growth expectations for the 22 and 23 school year. So our priority goal number one is for the school to regularly look at our school 
performance data and aggregate that classroom observation data and use the data to make decisions about school improvement and professional development needs. Some of our action steps for that is our EOC teachers looking at their EVOS data. Um, for our EOC teachers to look at their NC check-in data, this year we have uh, NC check-ins for all of our tested areas for EOCs, uh, Math 1, Math 3, Biology, and English 2. Our teachers are continuing to do peer walkthroughs. They are asked to do two peer walkthroughs each semester. We use the same walkthrough tool that the district is using. Um, and we take that data and we're looking at that along with the walk and talk data that is provided to us to determine where the needs are for professional development needs at Clinton High School. We're also looking at data with our PBIS in terms of discipline to determine how um, recognitions for students, but also areas of needs improvement for that data. All right, and our prior priority indicator number two, the principal plans opportunities for teachers to share their strengths with other teachers. So things that we're gonna kind of work or complete is teachers will complete two peer walkthroughs during the fall and two more for the spring semester. As Ms. Westerbeek said, um, our school improvement team will kind of go through those, but it also gives um, teachers who are performing the walkthroughs time to go into other classrooms, and kind of see what is working for other teachers and how they can kind of bring that back to their own classrooms and make their classrooms stronger. Um, we will also have departments will share best practices at staff meetings. And we kind of started this last year. Um, every staff meeting, um, they kind of do best practices for the science group. And so then again, we learn from other teachers and what works best for them. And then we can kind of cross curricular um, work for uh, make improve our classrooms. Um, the staff is also going to participate in monthly PLCs. Um, and BTs will have a mentor and a buddy teacher. Any questions you have for Clinton High School? Ms. Westerbeek, tell me what a personalized learning path is. What, what does that entail? So we're using Exact Path and our students in English 1 and our Foundations of Math 1 and Math 1 students, they took a diagnostic in that system and it has created a path based on their strengths and weaknesses. It has put them on grade level and then it gives them their assignments that they need. That is in addition to their instruction that they're receiving in their English and Math class. We will be taking the second diagnostic test the last few weeks, either this week or next week, um, to see their growth. We're hoping that we can close some of those gaps that they may have. Any other questions by board members? Dr. Johnson, yes. So I would say the same, I would say the same thing that I added to the middle school, uh, these, uh, this Principal Westerbeek and her team here, uh, Ashley and Sabrina, go above and beyond. Can't even talk about the, the work of uh, Ashley Slater as our EC chair. She fills in a lot uh, when we need help in the EC department, which has been a lot recently over the last couple of years. Uh, also, Sabrina is presently working in our Edenton Chawan partnership. Uh, and so, uh, of course, we all know that Principal Westerbeek goes above and beyond, but these this is just a great example of what we've seen uh, today, a great example of the dedicated teachers and staff we have here in Clinton City Schools. The comments or questions? Thank you for all you do. Yeah, we appreciate it. All right, if not, we need um, a motion to approve the Clinton High School School Improvement Plan as presented. Madam Chair, I make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Um, Hales. Can I get a second? Second. Second, um, Pastor Emanuel. All in favor, let it be known by the word aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carried. Thank you for, for everyone who has um, presented tonight. I know how hard you work. I know how long your days are. And we appreciate all you do. Thank you. Um, Ms. Westerbeek, if you want to come back up for the curriculum guide changes, if there are any questions, um, 
board, we have every year we go through the Clinton High School curriculum guide and we make changes based on um, DPI recommendations, based on recommendations from the school. And so what you have in front of you is a one page of just changes that were made to the curriculum guide. There wasn't anything that was that was major change wise. You'll see just some alignments of some things. Um, so if you have any questions as you look through that, Ms. Westerbeek will be happy to, to answer those for you. Any questions about curriculum guide changes for the high school? Were there any concerns you all had? No, sir. No. Do we need to approve the changes? Um, no, you don't. They're just informational changes. And we just wanted to make sure if you had any questions, Ms. Westerbeek was here to answer those changes. We will print uh, curriculum guides. I think they go to the press at the end of the month. And, and they'll be ready for next year. We'll start registering kids in February for next school year. Thank you, Ms. Westerbeek. It might not pertain to, to this, but the, the social studies class that's going to be mm -hmm. the, the finance class. Yes, economics. When Remind me when that goes into effect. Sure. So economics and personal finance will be taught next year. It's been in the curriculum guide for two years because we, we added it last year. Um, currently, Ms. Kwan, uh, Mr. Kwan and Ms. Lipenska went to 40 hours of training this summer. They received the standard course of study. They received all of the resources that they need to teach that. They're putting that course together. I will meet with them. We have one person in Sampson County proper teaching it at the early college right now they're going to line and meet with that particular teacher talk through get an idea of like who's coming in to um, best practices for guest speakers and and to align the curriculum so they're working on that now they'll meet with her in january and we'll have that curriculum ready to go um, and we'll look at it as a as a board because i promised you i would share that with you um, probably february and then it'll go into effect next school year so one thing, and I know we talked about it before, but mm -hmm. it, we had something on it today at work, so I, it was top of my mind. Mm -hmm. There are most banks in, in Clinton, um, and even the company I work for, is huge on financial education in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So, And they set aside a ton of freebie money, money. for it. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything I can do to help with mm -hmm. that... Um, as the curriculum develops and evolves, I, I know they would they would be willing to help because they do set aside funds for that exact purpose. Yep, absolutely. And there's a, a specific part of that curriculum that talks about um, um, being banked versus unbanked. And there's some other terminology in there that we teach students. So there'll be opportunities for guest speakers and, and um, programs to come through. So absolutely. And I'll present that to you guys in February. You. You're welcome. All right. And I, um, I, have a, I have a question. Yes, sir. We're going to get to the simplistics of money and show them how to balance a checkbook. Mm -hmm. And just because you swipe a debit card <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean you have money in the account. Or I think the class will be null and void. We are going to teach them some basic money skills, correct? Right. So part of the curriculum is is basic budgeting. Students have to do budgeting in terms of like how to how to manage a, a checking account, what it means to be banked and unbanked. Um, it goes into insurance, uh, what what um, auto insurance. It actually talks about um, life insurance, what the benefits of those are. They have them do a project where they're actually doing a budget based on um, a future career choice, there are lots and lots of opportunities for them to manage money in that class and have practical application. Um, I know that some of the guest speakers that have gone into the early college class, like Amy Rose from Horace Mann came in yesterday and talked to them about, you know, um, insurance and auto insurance. And if you have one ticket, what that does to your auto insurance. So a lot of practical application is in that course. Absolutely. And then budgeting and just running a checking account and being able to look at the money, subtract it on a register if, if that's what they choose to use to keep track of their money. So, yes, that is included in the curriculum, sir. Looking forward to it. Perfect. 
Any other questions? All right. Um, at our, I guess it would have been October board meeting, there was a request from the board to have our CTE kind of talk about our college and career prep programs. So I have, first, um, yep, I, I couldn't see around the podium, Miss Moore and Jamie Kennedy, who is from Samson Community College, the, to present to you about CTE credentials, certificates, and then also our CCP, our Career and College Promise Community College certif certifications and credentials. Okay. All right, so I just put the logo from each credential. We also have that in the curriculum guide. It just gives a good visual of what we offer um, in our classrooms. And the next slide just shows in the 21-22 school year, the credentials earned. So one of our priorities is to increase that by 3% three, uh, 3 the um, this school year. So we're working on that. I have a few that have actually been, um, DPI has actually added credentials to courses. Um, that were not offered in a specific course last year. So, for example, first aid is now offered in EMT um, or and stop the bleed. So, the more they open up credentials offered in courses, the more opportunities we have to increase as well. So, thus, we had 822 earned last year. And then the ways we advertise or recruit, however you want to put it, um, in 17, 18 school year, we started putting this in a chart format in the curriculum guide, and it has grown since, but that is also a push from the state as well, trying to get credentials in classrooms um, and certificates earned. The classroom teachers, the, the syllabus, um, it's all put in there because it's built into the curriculum. And so, um, so that's one of the things the teachers goes over with the students at the very beginning of the year, what they're going to be learning, what they'll be earning, such as serve safe or whatever it is that's put into the classroom. Um, some courses have the credential as the proof of learning. So we have three ways that we show proof of learning through the credential, the state assessment, or through your performance based measure. So some of our courses are actually um, the POLs, the cred credential. We don't have that many. We have Microsoft Excel and we have all of our public safety and our EMT courses are credential performance or proof of learning. Um, if a credential costs, CTE funds pays for the credential for the student to earn it. Um, last year, we got an extra pot of money in February, so it opened up more opportunities, especially for those credentials that cost a little bit more. So I'll use the example Foods 2, $36 a student for serve safe exam. So used to have, you know, that lot, a lot of money to spend $36 for let's say 40 kids to take the exam and half of them weren't even interested in it. So we had to set up uh, parameters, but now we're just trying to spend the money. So we're offering it to all. So that will possibly increase a lot of our credentials earned as well. Um, and then of course we have to go by whatever the credentialing vendor prereqs are put in place. Um, so it could be that our, so EMT is an example. It's a tier three credential, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So that's not going to be all 12 students in the class earning an EMT because they're not even going to be able to sit for the basic exam if they don't meet the prereq from the, the EMT um, vendor. Um, and no two credentials are alike. It's, hard, it's even hard for me to keep up with um, because every one of them, they're all different. Some you can take multiple times and some you've only got one opportunity. Um, so just everyone is different. Some are free, some are not. Um, some are hard to even get up with the vendor to figure out. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there. There's a lot to credentials and I'm learning every day. Um, and then our new position at the middle school is also getting all of the materials from the high school to share with her eighth the eighth graders. So they'll know coming in, what is a credential? What does that mean? What course offers the credential? And so on. Um, I wanted to just quickly, since I put the word tier in here, I wanted to quickly kind of mention what that means. So pretty much your, your DPI folks in CTE, along with um, Department of Commerce, they work together to figure out um, what is more valuable than the other. So a tier one is considered what I call foundational cert certification. Um, that is going to be like NC Hunter Safety. Your tier two credential is kind of like a springboard or door opener certification. It might be put on vacancy notices. Um, you know, if you have a certain credential, 
will look for that whenever you get the job. So a serve safe certification would be a tier two. And then a tier three is your very advanced. It's pretty much what you might have to have to get the job like EMT. So they're going to be a little bit harder to earn. And we actually only have uh, one tier three even course that offers a tier three credential, which is the EMT. Um, is that it? Yes, I think that's all. Do y'all have any questions? Next is the community college information. Questions of Ms. Moore about CTE. And if you're interested to know how DPI even knows what credential to offer in a course, they sit with a lot of folks to try to figure it out. They have a website where businesses can go on and pretty much apply to help put put the ball rolling, I guess you could say, to get the credential in a course in high school. Um, so that's kind of how they, they all have to come to the table and work together to figure out, here's the course we offer, here's the curriculum, how can we match it up? Um, and so credentials change. I'm not going to say it's a nightmare, but sometimes I feel that way. I'll go and look, and next thing I know, there's one added, just like I said, you know, Stop the Bleed wasn't offered in EMT last year, and, it now, and now it is. So it might, even though it wasn't advertised, that's because, you know, sometimes it's out of our control what's offered and when it's offered. And we have a curriculum guy that's due fairly early. So um, if you don't see it in the curriculum guide, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to be offered because it may slide in there over the summer. And so if it's offered at the DPI level, we're going to offer it whether we've advertised it or not, just because it's part of the course um, and we want to do that. Any other, y'all have questions? Okay. All right, Jamie. As Dr. Molina said earlier, my name is Jamie Kennedy. I'm the lead career coach at Samson Community College. I serve Clinton High School as well as the private schools, home schools, and out-of-county students. I also oversee all of the career coaches at the county schools. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on our CTE pathways at the community college and how we work with the high school, both Clinton High School and others. Um, to guide our students into these pathways. So each Clinton High School CTE pathway has an approved CCP pathway. CCP is Career and College Promise. Um, each of these can lead directly into a program at Sampson. Um, some of the credentials offered via our degree programs, we have our certified nursing assistant. Um, you Students can receive that certification after passing the state exam at the end of NAS 101, which is Nurse Aid 1. Um, beef and pork quality assurance, completion of the applied animal science diploma program. So that one takes a little bit longer, um, but if they've completed the BQA credential at the high school level, they then get the PQA on top of that. Um, the last one that I have is the NC Early Childhood Credential, which is necessary for working in any form of child care. Um, the completion of EDU 119 is uh, how students receive that credential as well. Um, we have a few students in that class currently, so we hope that credentials come out of that. Um, certificates are available in each CCP CTE pathway, but not all guarantee a credential. Um, so as you can see, I listed out some of the certificate completion for the 21-22 school year. Um, 15 community Spanish interpreter certificates, two welding, one electrical, one business, and one CNA completion. I hope to see those go up this year as we... Um, work in collaboration more with the CTE department. I listed out the complete list of our CTE pathways just because um, you might see some overlap in what we offer at the high school versus what we offer at the college. Um, there are some things that expand into, or all of them expand into bigger degree programs. So when a student enters the CCP program, there is a certificate that they have to complete before moving into the full degree program. And this is a list of all of them that we offer. Um, we have students in almost every single one, if not as their primary pathway, as their secondary pathway. Um, advertisement recruitment, whatever you want to call it, like Ms. Moore said, um, the Implementation of career coaches in high school has been essential, not just here in rural North Carolina, but all across the state. Um, we are lucky to have career coaches at every high school in the county. Um, not all community colleges have that luxury. Um, we know that not 
all 58 college uh, community colleges even have career coaches. Um, so some of the things we do to kind of integrate into the high school, um, lunch and learns have been the most popular recruitment efforts, especially coming out of COVID. Now that the lunchrooms have opened back up fully, I know that last year, last school year, um, the cafeteria was not open as much. So there were very limited students. Now, when the faculty come out from the community college and get to see every student at Clinton High School, they enjoy seeing everybody smiling faces. Um, in the year of 2022, we've had representative from each CTE area at Clinton High School, and we are working to um, get some more out in the spring. High school tours of CTE programs. Last fall, Clinton City Schools and Sampson County Schools collaborated with Sampson to create a day full of tours of CTE programs. Um, Sampson County Schools just recently did one, and currently I, as, long as, as well as the CDC at the high school, are planning a tour for the spring. So that will be open. We plan on opening it to not just 11th and 12th graders who are maybe considering Sampson as their after high school plan, but also to our 8th, 9th, and 10th graders for career exploration purposes. We have a career fair coming up on March 29th that is being headed up by my supervisor, Ms. Emily Brown, and myself. Um, we will be working to bus Clinton High School students to campus to attend. It will not so much be a hiring event as much as a career fair, a true career fair where they can kind of see, you know, even if you do want to go to a four-year school after, after you graduate, you can still come back and here's where you can work in Sampson County. Um, students planning to attend Sampson Community College after graduation are being connected to their success coach via their career coach. So we have just implemented a success coach model at uh, Sampson Community College. We have two. Um, the CTE success coach is fabulous. And so anybody who's continuing into our CTE path after high school, we have worked in connecting them just so that they know they've had people while they're at the high school that care about them and are there to help them. And they will have a person when they're at the community college as well. Um, the biggest form of advertisement, I think, is the continuous collaboration between the CDCs and the career coach. Um, I know I have worked personally with Christy Moore, and um, recently we added Ms. Kim Fan and Ms. Natasha Faircloth here at middle school. Um, I have been in talks with them. I do quite a few uh, classroom presentations, um, as well as I'm currently working with Ms. Faircloth to work out a time where I can come over to the middle school and tell them about the programs as well, so that way they get that early intervention. Do we have any questions for me? Perhaps. Questions for Ms. Kennedy? You so want to have any questions? It's not really a question, but since they're both here, I'll, I'll mention it. It was something I mentioned to you earlier. Um, the North Carolina Tobacco Trust Fund Commission has a grant out there that will fund things since we're in the largest agriculture county in the state. They will fund a agriculture academy at a local high school. And it's a partnership between the Tobacco Trust Fund, the local high school, and the local community college. Um, and we're talking mega bucks. So we had talked earlier, I may have been in that October board meeting, I guess, like a, a, a small farming operation constructed at our high school whether that would be a a hog barn facility or something to show these kids some hands-on things where they may not come out of high school and roll into a farming operation where they can actually own the hog farm or the chicken farm but they could develop a trade skill that that they could um, they could use on on a facility like that. So it's the North Carolina Tobacco Trust Fund Commission, and they have that they have a grant out there for an agriculture academy at a local high school. Absolutely, and we and we have had push from local legislators as well to expand our applied animal science program, just because, like you said, we are the largest agricultural county in the state. Um, so that would definitely be something that I think the community college would be interested in collaborating on and I think the tr the tobacco trust fund we we've received monies from them before for other things so I'm sure we've got that that contact information uh, I would just share that I did have <coughs> just I did have a conversation with mr. Lennon about that yesterday um, he has experience uh, st. Paul's had a, a chicken farm on their campus um, and uh, 
he had some concerns around liability um, and just remembered a time when uh, they had a bad hurricane mm -hmm. and they had to be out of school for 38 days and mm -hmm. he wasn't able to get to the chicken farm. Luckily, he had another one of his colleagues that lived two blocks away from the school and was able to do that. He fully supports the initiative. Uh, we would just need to determine, uh, number one, what we could get approved by the city council, yep. uh, as well as the Board of Education. Um, would we want to look, this is where he and I didn't know. And so this is kind of what, it's kind of my question to the board. I didn't know if we just wanted a shell of a house, like with the stuff in it, or if we actually wanted to have livestock on campus. So that, I just know the agriculture pays all the bills of Sampson County. Just need to remind everybody that mm -hmm. that food don't come from food line or college C's. Mm -hmm. And and they their FFA chapter, mm -hmm. as you said, Mr. Bell, mm -hmm. they don't have the right. 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 And they've actually turned it into a money thing. Mm -hmm. West Row End High School, I believe, is the high school. They actually have a um, a, a goat facility, mm -hmm. and they make soap out of it, and that funds right. whatever right. that is. We looked into it when Mr. Barlow yeah. was here. Yeah. Um, so briefly. And there's other like you could have the barn, but you wouldn't necessarily have to have animals in it. If you used it at build a modern state of the art facility for these kids to learn the intricacies of a building like that. If you wanted to have animals in it, there is insurance. I mean, that's what I do for a living. There is insurance out there that not only insures the building itself, but it insures the animals inside the buildings. Again, this is a much deeper conversation <laughs> now that we're getting. But the grant's out there. Go Thank you. Check that grant out. And, and so the board, I'm on, John. Uh, the, 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 the board will have to, you know, note and discuss what we would like the specifics to be. But uh, I, I just want to caution uh, um, as we start these conversations that we will also need to ensure, because um, as was discussed with me, um, there's no days off when it comes to, mm -hmm chickens or, or, or hogs. So you have to consider um, travel. salary and travel of your current teachers as well, because they're going to be working seven days a week. Uh, so that was mentioned to me. So I want to want to make sure I mentioned it to the board as well. If we have live animals actually in the barn or the facility, we're all in favor of it. Um, just wanted to mention that as well. And I've written down the information. I'll pull the grant and we'll look at the grant, the three of us, and then we'll bring some recommendations back. Okay. I do have another comment, not to belabor anything. I'm sorry, Dr. Uh -huh. Molinas. But what we've just been talking about is going to become, not that it's not important now, super important. As Jeremy just noted, it, we're num number one or two agricultural production uh, in, in the world, I believe, when it comes to For sure in the country. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So... But uh, I was recently in a conversation and have been for the last month on school performance grade redesign. And mm -hmm. just today, um, the number two thing that was mentioned was earning advanced credits in high school, including students enrolled in AP, IB, students enrolled in CTE advanced honors classes, CTE pathways, JROTC, work-based learning. So this will become part of the school accountability model at mm -hmm. the high school if approved by the legislators. Now, of course, anything that DPI, but DPI, this is going to be a part that DPI sends forward to the legislators, and it will be just as important uh, as four-year graduation rate and performance on EOCs. Mm -hmm. uh, so just wanted to let you know that this is big now and very important now but it will become part of the school performance grade uh, in uh, subsequent years if approved by, leg by our legislators. Mm -hmm. I just want to recognize that we had 822 credentials provided last year. So I think that's a really good start. Um, as Ms. Moore mentioned, um, 
the goal in our strategic plan was to increase that by 3% each year. So it is also in our district improvement plan. And you'll see that next month that we've added that as one of our career college um, goals to have that increase. So 3% of that puts it at what? 830 maybe. So we'll increase that 3% each year. So we, we do have that as a goal, but I thought 822 was, was pretty good for one year of, of students when we have 780 probably didn't students. look like that year before. I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but so that kind of helped help drop that, but we did pretty good. Later. Right. So that's a good baseline number. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that baseline number. So thank you ladies. Yes. Thank you. All right. Moving on, um, I just wanted to share with you, we talked last month about um, our TSI, our targeted school um, letters had to go home before November 30th. This is a copy of each of the letters that went home from each of the schools that is a TSI school. They're in English and Spanish. I, I, you don't have to read through them. I just wanted to make sure you had access to a copy so you know what types of things that we shared. Most of them talk about the school improvement plan, how they're going to work. All of the schools listed were TSI for students with disabilities. Um, and so you'll see the efforts that are being made and the school improvement goals that'll help support students with disabilities. And so all of the schools that had to send those letters home, they're right there for you to look at if you so choose. We did want to take a minute to highlight Native American Heritage Month and um, all of the things that were going on in Clinton City Schools last month. Um, you'll see as you go through the presentation, there's just different bulletin boards were set up at all of the schools. We had some information sessions. Kids were able to build bracelet, make bracelets and do some um, Native American um, music and crafts. That's, we had a, a rock your mocks. Your, and so we had um, students wear their moccasins to school on one day at the middle school. So you see some moccasins there. We were um, happy to have um, Bracey Gibbs, one of our uh, Samson Middle School students, highlighted in this news article from ABC 11, I believe it was, um, at minute 153. He is dancing in um, a powwow, I believe, when we had our powwow on September 10th in the Kohari tribe. So this article talks about the Kohari tribe. So if you'd like to see him dance. And then um, Samson Middle School did take pictures and highlight all of their students who are of Native heritage and what tribes they come from, if they knew particularly what tribe they were. So we were excited about that. So I believe that's the last slide. So um, we just wanted to make sure you know we highlighted that for you. So we were super proud of all the things that are going on and we hope that only gets bigger every year. Uh huh. Absolutely. Um, and then the last thing for you, um, we talked, I know we talked about it last month, maybe the month before, the literacy instructional standards. Um, we had to have an evaluation of Clinton City Schools. So we have spent the last six, eight weeks doing walkthroughs, looking at curriculum guides, looking at lesson plans, K-12, every classroom in Clinton City. And so what you have in front of you is the evaluation we will turn into DPI. It's due the 15th. It will be out of my hands tomorrow because it is done. Um, I, I don't like to wait the last minute to get things done. But you'll go through and you can see we looked at the environment, the curriculum, and instruction in K-12. And um, we just gave a narrative and we rated ourselves whether we were fully implemented, partially implemented, or not yet. And what this will do, DPI will get this, and then we will create a professional development plan that aligns directly with those literacy intervention standards um, to help support that. And those literacy intervention standards are part of Senate Bill 387, which is our literacy RTA read to achieve legislation. So that is for your perusal. I think it's 32 pages long. Any questions? It, yeah, it was it was a little bit of work, but it's done. Any questions of Dr. Malinas regarding any of the items that she presented or have presented in her area? If not, we welcome 
Mr. Edgerton to the room. Give me the <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about insurance, right? Actually, we're talking about speeding tickets. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Malinas and everyone else who presented. Um, now, uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, Mr. Lowe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Board members, I've got highlighted items that have changed in the technology and facilities information items. Um, Power School Unified Insights was the platform our team chose as the the platform to sort of consolidate all the data surrounding students of the kind of a whole child view um, that is in the data validation stage and will be soon be implemented for staff in Clinton City Schools. We're helping we're hoping early in the second semester and that will help teachers make some decisions about targeted interventions and enrichments because it will give them a view and they don't have to go out and gather the data from all the platforms. It puts it all in one place for them. So we'll be working on that. Um, Dr. I'm going to pass the the baton to Dr. Molinas for implementation once I verify all the data is where it needs to be. Um, capital projects, the resurfacing of the remaining viable tennis courts was completed several weeks ago. Um, Carolina Court Works actually came out today. They were having their pre-construction meeting with um, uh, Department of Rec and they came over and looked at our courts and they're going to give me some budget information as soon as they can about what it would take as a final resolution for our court issues where we're having the sinkhole and the drain tile. So we'll get some comparative just sort of budget information and then we'll have more talks about how do we want to proceed and when do we want to proceed. Um, Butler Avenue School Administration has been requesting for many years uh, some additional fencing to enhance security at that site and we were able to make that happen with capital outlay this year and that's complete. Um, Dr. Malcolm has decided that on the weekends all of those fences will be locked when we don't have occupation of the building by our staff and students. Of course, during the school day, we can't lock those gates because we need egress for fire and, and other threats. But uh, hopefully that will encourage community members to not utilize our facilities without permission and not to wander through the campus during the instructional day because that's an increasing concern, especially with first and second graders. Um, the ESSERS funded HVAC renovations is moving forward. Um, we bid that twice. And so by the federal uniform guidance, we're allowed to now sole source that. We have been in contact with Piedmont Service Group who does a lot of work in our area. And they're working on a bid for the equipment and installation. They're having trouble with subcontractors getting bids from them. So it's delayed, but they are working on it. Um, the Guaranteed Energy Savings Project, we have some progress updates, and the latest one is from 12.2. So you can see the solar PV system on top of Sunset was supposed to go active November 11th, but we had a storm, and so we couldn't do anything on that date. So we've rescheduled that for January 3rd for some trenching, and then on the 4th, we should go active. Um, HVAC, the water source heat pump, domestic water heater, we just could not get. There was extended lead times. It wasn't going to happen. So we've changed that to the natural gas fired domestic hot water. Um, that's planned to go in January 2nd through 6th while staff and students are not in the building. So we'll have quite a bit of work during the holiday break at um, sunset finalizing those projects. Sampson Middle, here's the new chiller going in. That was an interesting operation with the crane in place. I spoke to the crane operator. I think I want to go get certified in that because he made a lot of take home money for putting in, pulling out one chiller and putting in a new. But um, the sensors and all of that is, uh, is scheduled for Thursday. That's why it's a little warm in here right now because Sampson Middle has no chilling capacity. Um, the startup is for, scheduled for Thursday morning. So that's a, a big project on that one. Some hey John, there. Yes. You, you get your certs in that. I'm a certified rigger, so we could. Uh, oh, we could. We could, we could go into business together. Yeah, yeah the he, he spent a lot of time waiting on the riggers, waiting on you know other things to happen before he ever operated the crane. But it's uh, you've got to be uh, very careful and very confident in your maneuvers when you're moving heavy equipment. Um, 
I already talked about the water source heat pump. We had some training on those tools, uh, new units at the at sunset today. Um, Clinton High School is getting variable flow devices on some uh, air handlers that were just constant volume. And that's not very any energy efficient because even when it doesn't need much cooling, you're sitting there blowing it wide open um, on the controllers for the fan. So we're putting those in. We've got one more that was delayed in shipment that's going to go in this week. And then we'll get the controls situated on those. Um, so that should wrap up at Clinton High. There's some pictures of those and the energy recovery units that were um, fixed there. And then we've just got the get all the control system set up to do what it needs to do to operate those systems. So it's underway and it's working. So that project should wrap up soon. Um, grant submittals, the door access control. We had some issues with equipment that we ordered. We were told would work with existing applications and then it did not. And they're going to have to reorder, but they're coming back as soon as they can, pending that equipment arriving. Um, some good news on the needs-based public school capital funding that we had approximately 900,000 for from the state. Um, we actually had 10 different vendors attend the pre-bid meeting November 7th. We've never had a turnout like that. I had, I had 18 people from 10 different vendors and we had to shift our meeting from the conference room to the cafeteria. We had so many people and they walked the roofs at Carr, Butler and Sunset. Those bids are due the 8th. We hope they come in with uh, very competitive price points. They saw they had competition that day. So that should help tremendously. Um, yep, Clinton City Schools, I think Dr. Johnson has already let you know, but we did receive, um, through Dr. Van's help, because this is a federal grant that had to be entered in CCIP and the budget in BAS, BAS, but we did receive the $44,000 that the state can allot. That's the amount, maximum amount they will allot to a PSU to add an additional SRO. So, um, it, it, it just worked out that we had a previous SRO was ready to move back into that. And so Officer Banos is joining us to be our SRO for the elementary schools. And she's going to be an asset in that capability. And we're still exploring multi-factor authentication. That is a big change process to have people have to use a second device to log into things. But it will enhance our security and it will help us reduce our cybersecurity insurance premiums. But it's going to take a while to get that in place and get the culture changed. So uh, you mean I have to have my phone to log into my computer? That's what it's going to mean. And that will be a big change, but it, it will keep you secure. So that's sort of my informational items tonight. Let me know if you have any questions. Have you all seen any difference in supply chain issues from getting back anywhere near the pre COVID? It's Can easy. You tell the difference. It's easing up a little bit um, on the, the roofing side. Insulation is freely available now, where at one point, the ISO insulation, you just could not get. Um, tech side is, is loosening up a little bit. We're still having issues with some control systems um, and chips, because China is continuing to have issues, and their latest issues are just going to impact that even more. Whatever had loosened up is probably going to get worse before it gets better, but it is some better, but it's it's not by any means back to where it was pre-COVID. Other questions of Mr. Lowe regarding um, auxiliary services technology? If not, thank you for your hard work. I know the delays can be problematic, but what can you do but wait? Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Ms. Next item on the agenda is uh, Ms. Peterson's section on human capital. Uh, she's not here today, but she has left us some homework for the holiday. <laughs> uh, there are several um, 11 board policies to be read before we meet again in January. So that's your homework for the holidays, reading board policies. So Make sure you get that done before we meet again. Um, see, we have some parents and some students in our audience. And I see Dr. Malcolm has joined us as well, if there's anybody else or not. Our um, student 
uh, recognition is scheduled for 5 30 so give us a few more minutes we have our superintendent's going to give us some items and we'll we'll break around 5 30 to, to get that recognition done thank you so much for joining us dr johnson thank you madam chair members of the board always good to see our students and our families and i think dr brunson just gave me a time limit <laughs> Which, might, which may not be a bad thing. As, as you've been a part of our meetings, uh, you know that I can be uh, very lengthy. Um, one of the things that we always like to do is read our cards of acknowledgement and gratitude. Uh, and I actually have one from a former uh, staff member here, Ms. Patricia Stevens. Uh, dear Wesley Johnson, uh, well, dear Dr. Wesley Johnson, the CCS board members, just sending a big thank you for allowing me to be part of CCS for 23 years. Such a wonderful school district. It was such a great honor and pleasure to have been one of CCS's custodians before retiring. Every day was an adventure, but at the end of the day, we're all doing whatever it takes for our CCS children. Thanks for all you do for your CCS custodians with big thanks from me, Patricia Stevens. And if you know Miss Pat, she also had a husband that was uh, one of our custodians as well. So we uh, really support them, wish them well uh, in their retirement efforts. Um, we got two cards, but I'll I'll make I'll make them to be one because they were uh, written to all six of the board members and also to myself and my staff. And this is from our new attorney Rebecca Williams from Pointer Sproul, and it says, "Wondering what we're grateful for this Thanksgiving season." P.S. It's you. And it says, thank you for supporting Pointer Sproul this year. We wish you and your family a wonderful Thanksgiving and a merry holiday season. And Rebecca says, we are thankful to be working with you all, attorney Rebecca Williams. So, and I know she's joining us. Did, Rebecca, did we, do we get a free two minutes since he gave Pointer and Sproul a shout out? <laughs> I think so. No. No. <laughs> um, we're going to move on into the good news, and this will just springboard us right into some additional good news. So always looking for a way to make this a little uh, less taxing on uh, me and all of you. You know that uh, Dr. Molinas does a good job with her weekly memos. So I've actually combined all of her shout outs uh, from the from the minute from the meetings previously between our last board meeting and this board meeting into one document. Uh, many of you will have seen this before because again, it comes from doc, uh, Dr. Molinas and we send it out to CCS all uh, every Monday, usually uh, after cabinet. So I'm going to kind of go through uh, this very quickly, but you've got the red ribbon week information and several photos. You've got photos from our Dark Horse fellows who visited UNCW Future Teacher Conference. There's some additional photos as well. You've got uh, two EC teachers that are being highlighted, Ms. Carissa Rayner uh, from, from Sunset Avenue for being our educator of excellence. You've got Alondra Williams from the high school uh, for her successful showing of student-made goods at her uh, bazaar. Uh, our marching band, you've got some information from the Midway Band Day that was held on September, October the 29th, and we were in the 5A. Then you've got some pictures uh, and some other information on our band day. That was the that was the all the trophies, and then this was wonderful. The fireworks were spot on. They were right in the middle, right in the middle, right in the middle, Mr. Edgerton. So you know we've got a couple of board members that really like fireworks, or either they're pyromaniacs, might be a little both, uh, but uh, they like to shoot the fireworks off. And this was uh, to. to uh, highlight that evening and we had our band performing it went went great uh the next is congratulations to all of our hosa students who participated in our hosa regional leadership conference many first second and third place winners right there again all of this information has been sent out uh so I'm not going to spend a lot of time then you've got our uh, career development coordinators. You've got Miss Natasha Fairclaw, Miss Kim Fan. Miss Kim Fan's at the high school part time. Natasha is full time. She works at Sunset and at our middle school. You've got uh, our students who have been nominated uh, for governor school. They will move on to the next uh, next round and we'll hopefully uh, find out in February uh, how many of these students will be moving forward uh, in their governor school. And you can see that we have uh, 
our five students they are very proud of these uh young men and young ladies child nutrition talking about being proud uh we had uh 23 that participated you heard a while ago serve safe uh we had we're trying to get all of our child nutrition staff uh serve safe certified and we had 23 of them that tested and 21 of the 23 passed. Uh, so very good job to our child nutrition staff. Some more information on Miss Alondra Williams. She was able to uh, uh, get awarded a grant from around the world one bite at a time. And Miss Reese and her OCS students were awarded a grant for their student enterprise. Uh, you, we just heard about Officer Banos a while ago, but our SROs did a fantastic job presenting to our sixth grade students on social and situational awareness. Then you've got a whole list of students that just did a remarkable job in our DECA. They were regional winners. You can see what they won. Again, many first place, top threes, uh, just did a fantastic job. You can see those students. We've got pictures. We've got their names there doing a great job. More information about the work that Natasha Faircloth is doing. Uh, we uh, brought in Dr. William Oglesby to our uh, to our fifth graders. He was a career guest speaker at Sunset Avenue. We've got new uh, newly formed FFA at our middle school, and we've got our new officers there. You can see our new officers at our Sampson School, Sampson Middle School, uh, as well as the following middle school students participated. Uh, there you go, John, in the state FFA livestock evaluation career. Uh, there And there's uh, some pictures uh, below that with students that also partided, uh, participated in the hunt horse arena. Uh, and then you've got some more information from Natasha Faircloth there and all the work that she's doing. The last thing, John, is our Toys for Tots. Just a reminder that we are still accepting uh, toys uh, through December the 9th. If you go down to the very bottom of that page, John, you'll see what is allowable and what is not allowable. So if you have any items that you would like to bring in, I believe all of our schools have the big boxes and we would like uh, to uh, ensure, uh, to ask our community members and our board to continue to participate in our toy drive. But again, all of that comes from Dr. Molinas's weekly updates. So, so then my items to highlight would be after that, John. Uh, and so Christian Ortiz, uh, he had the honor of representing CHS by qualifying for the 2A Cross Country State Championship that was held November the 5th in Kernersville. And so we congratulate Christian and on his work there. Uh, also uh, to uh, Mr. Kevin Hall, John, if you'll click on that uh, link there. Uh, Kevin Hall was named and recognized as the NCHSSA uh, 2A Eastern representative. Kevin is the, uh, sh he's not the taller one in the picture, but you can see Kevin there. And uh, Kevin just has an energy and passion that is contagious. And that's what I put in, in my uh, in my good news. Great job, Kevin. Congratulations as well to our men's soccer team. We finished 23-3-3, and perfect record in the SAC 7. We're Eastern champions with a 1-0 win over Manio. They advanced to the state championship game uh, that went into four overtimes, and then we lost in PKs 4-3. to three. Fantastic season uh, to our men's soccer team and our coaches. Uh, as well, congratulations to our varsity football team, who also was undefeated in conference, 11-2 and two overall. They advanced to the third round. They lost 28-27 on a failed two-point conversion at the end of the game to East Duplin, who still play it. Uh, so East Duplin is in the, the state championship. So, uh, so if you, you know, if you lose, you want to lose to a team that's still playing. Uh, and uh, there's the same night, by the way. Yeah, it was the same night. So I had board members at one of the events. I think I had at least three there. I was at the state championship soccer game. We were texting each other the whole night. And it was cold. It was, it, was, cold. it was cold. It was cold. Uh we already talked about we already talked about the next one, John. I'm sorry, this is a repeat, but we had Dark Horse Fellows that participated in the future teacher conference. Uh, several teachers recently received uh, well, several teachers and a school recently received simple gifts. Uh, grants, Melissa Reese, Popcorn Fridays to Student Enterprise. Uh, she's an EC teacher at Clinton High School. Jeffrey Tart is our band uh, teacher, Small Town, the Big Apple. And Alondra Williams, we've already noted, EC teacher around the world one bite at a time. And then four 
Sunset teachers combined to write a grant. Sharnay White, Jenny Boyette, Kiara Cogdale, and Diana Viella, uh, get your teach on. I all received a simple gifts, and then Sampson Middle School faculty and staff received a simple gifts grant to travel to D.C. on a work day, uh, and it's an overnight, and uh, they will receive the, the grant if at least 51% of the faculty and staff agree to travel to D.C., and I think they already got they already got that. So uh, uh, they, they wrote the grant because they discovered that many of their faculty and staff had never been to D.C., uh, so that was interesting. Congratulations to Miss Nikki Melvin Thompson, who got a Donors Choose grant. Let's tell a story. Congratulations to Miss Amy Hare, pre-K teacher. Nikki's a kindergarten teacher. Amy Hare's a pre-K teacher. She also got a Donors Choose grant for a book each day. Helps me grow my vocabulary. We talked a while ago about the uh, Native American Heritage Month, and uh, Miss Angelique Young, who is the guidance counselor here, one of the guidance counselors here at Sampson Middle, she was highlighted in this article in Ed NC. Uh, and so uh, I don't know why it's not coming up, uh, but uh, it just worked like two hours ago. But anyway, uh, it's, a it's a good article. And she was uh, doing some jewelry and some bead design with students at Union High School. Uh, but it was featured in that article. John, you can just click out of it. Uh, Nathan Chabot and Dr. Angela Harding have been chosen to participate in STAMP which is the Southeast, Southeast Education Alliance Assistant Principal Instructional Leadership Program. Uh, somewhat related to that is Dr. Nicole uh, Freeman Carroll has been selected to participate in Cohort 2 of the AP Accelerator Program. And that's the program that Tony went through and is still going through uh, now with NC Papa. Uh, we already talked about uh, future principal Dr. Facing and his work with Gardner Webb. So uh, highlighting his work. I was so proud of him. Dr. Molinas was part of a distinguished group that presented to the state board on November the 1st uh, in regards to uh, raising student proficiency in reading. Dr. Molinas and Dr. Van are also representing Clinton uh, City Schools and participate in the aspiring superintendents program. Uh, and so there's a picture there if you would like to see that. Uh, congratulations to all of our faculty and staff who uh, worked so hard to help us meet our goal for United Way. We actually exceeded our goal of 10,000. Last count was 10,895. It's probably more than that. Uh, for those of y'all that had the pleasure to work with Dr. Robert Taylor, uh, Dr. Robert Taylor has been named the new state superintendent of Mississippi. Uh, he's a former CCS employee. And as they said um, at the uh, meeting last uh, last week, he has 300,000 reasons why he's excited to be the new state <laughs> superintendent of Mississippi. And he and he's retiring from North Carolina. This is his, this is his 30th year. So he's going to be going down to uh, be the new state superintendent in Mississippi. Yeah, going home. He's from Mississippi. Um, Congratulations to the CCS Board of Education members for all of their recent achievement and acknowledgments. We had two members, Dr. Brunson and Ms. Carol Worley, who earned more than 30 hours of training credits uh, last year. Dr. Brunson also received the Certificate of Advanced Achievement, which is a cumulative total of 201 to 300 hours. Ms. Carol Worley earned the Gold Award which is 801 to 900 cumulative hours of uh, credits. And then our other board members, Mr. Edgerton, Pastor Emanuel, uh, Mr. Hales, and Dr. Rodriguez earned uh, between 12 and 29 hours of credit last, uh, last year. And because of all their work, our uh, board was acknowledged with the Gold Bell Award for every member of our board earning at least 12 or more training credits. And there were very few, I, I'm going to say less than 10, um, systems that got the gold award uh, or gold bell award. So congratulations uh, to all of our, uh, all of our good news uh, recipients and everything. If it's okay, if it's the pleasure of the board, I'm okay to uh, uh, stop in my, uh, my items and just, and do the good news for our, um, our other group. I didn't finish up. Like yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Congratulations to all the students and staff and board for um, 
the recognition that he's just shared with us makes me very proud to be a dark horse, uh, even in cold weather on some Friday nights. It was a it was a good game and a good showing for everybody. Again, uh, um, we're gonna stop now. It's 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 five thirty. Actually, it's five twenty nine. So Dr. Johnson gave us a minute back um, to recognize our students of the month. Thank you again for parents and your students for um, attending our meeting tonight. Um, we're going to stop just right now for Dr. Malanus and Dr. Johnson to um, begin our recognition education spotlight for students of the month. And we have some students who represented us very well in Greensboro a couple of weeks ago at the North Carolina School Board Association's um, Elementary Art Contest. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Malanus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, as I will say, it's always great to see uh, not only members of our faculty and staff here with us, but uh, our parents and our students. And that's what this time is to do, is to honor our students for their hard work uh, in uh, many character ed and other things we'll see in just a few minutes arts uh, as well. Uh, we're going to ask, just like we did last um, month, uh, as Dr. Molinas uh, reads the information uh, to the board and to our uh, to our visitors tonight, that the principals uh, will come up. I think we have all principals here except for uh, Principal Brown. Uh, I can serve in Principal Brown's stead. Uh, if the if they'll if the parent if the principals will bring up the students. And when the students come up, uh, parents, if you will stand as your students are being recognized, that will assist every, uh, assist tonight. So Dr. Molinas. So we have two months worth of students to recognize. Our first is Elsie Carr, Madalie Chaveria. Oh, I don't know if I could read that. She's not here. Well, I'm going to read her anyways. Um, Madalie is an outstanding student. The moment she walks into the classroom, she lights up the room with her smile and bubbly personality. Her positive attitude is very inspiring to those around her. Since day one, Madalie has shown courage by walking into school independently and participating in small and whole group settings without hesitation. She engages in friendly conversation with her classmates and offers encouragement to them with kind words. We are proud to name Madalie our October LC Carr Student of the Month. <laughs> Butler Avenue School. Dr. Malcolm is going to present Carla Villalobos Vega. Carla is a trooper. Although she might face some challenges, she never complains or shut down. She perseveres. She is determined. Carla tries hard and is always, is always joyful. She uses courage to face her adversities with grace. Carla is a role model for what it means to work hard with a positive attitude. We recognize Carla Villalobos Vega. All right, Sunset Avenue School, Braylon Coxon. Okay, I'm going to read Braylon anyways. Braylon is always a horse when he is at school. He is uh, he and he always shows encouragement in any situation. He shows kindness and compassion to his peers and his teachers. He always has a smile and a warm hello for anyone he comes in contact with. He is a ray of sunshine and he loves to make others happy. Congratulations, Braylon. <laughs> Sampson Middle School. Okay, we're Darielle Gonzalez Peraza. Uh, Dariel is a great student. He works hard to get his work completed accurately and on time. Dariel is always respectful and a friend to everyone. Congratulations to Dariel. Um, Clinton High School, Ms. Shayla Aguilar. Okay, Shayla is an asset to our class and others. She serves as a role model and a leader. Shayla is always willing to help a student in need. She participates in class discussions and works extremely hard in all aspects. Congratulations to Shayla. All right, those were the October students of the month. Let's move on to November. There we go. All right, Elsie Carr, Scarlet Gray. 
Ah, yay. Scarlett is a joy to teach and have as a student at LC Carr. She works diligently in all her academic areas in kindergarten. She is a student who always thinks positively. Scarlett brightens our day with her positive attitude from the moment she walks in the door. She is always willing to help out her friends and share an idea and even gives compliments to her classmates. She's eager and ready to learn every day. Scarlett has an attitude of gratitude and we are thankful for her excitement to learn and to share. Yay. Congratulations, Scarlett. <laughs> All right, Butler Avenue School, Zaley Wynn. Zaley is always very upbeat and cares about her classmates. She is a true dark horse leader in all areas of our school. Every day she comes in with her positive personality and works hard to maintain her strong academic standing. Zaley is always willing to lend a helping hand to others and demonstrates gratitude regularly. Congratulations, Zaley. Um, Sunset Avenue, Luis Fernandez Hernandez. Doesn't look like Luis is here. Our character trait for the month is gratitude. We are very thankful to have Luis in our class this year. He is a wonderful student and works very hard every single day at school. Congratulations, Luis. <laughs> Samson Middle School, Serenity Hobbs. Okay, Serenity is a sweet child and an outstanding student. She loves to read and play with her little sister. Her favorite color is blue and she loves visiting water parks with her family. Congratulations, Serenity. Clinton High School, Jordan Wilson. Okay. Jordan is a terrific student who handles her business consistently. She is well-mannered and very conscientious of the quality of her work. Jordan is very studious and an excellent role model for her peers. She always exhibits dark horse pride. Congratulations, Jordan. All right, so our National School Board Association Elementary School Poster Contest winners. Congratulations, Clinton City School. We had our honorable mentions were Braylon Griffin from LC Carr in kindergarten. Okay. Clark's T. Serafina, kindergarten, LC Carr. All right, and then in first grade, we have Evelyn Simmons from Butler Avenue School. Yay, Evelyn. <laughs> and you can see her beautiful drawing that she made. She's thanking us for being awesome. Congratulations, Evelyn. The next one is Gianna Williams. Nope. Okay. Elijah Williamson, first grade also at Butler Avenue. Okay, perfect. Carly Morales Castillo, second grade at Butler Avenue. There's Carly. Take a look at that wonderful picture. <laughs> Yay, congratulations, Carly. The next one is Risi Padilla Ruiz. Her picture says, we love you teachers. Sweet. Congratulations, Risi. 
congratulations to our national school board, North Carolina School Board Association winners. Lots of winners. All right, our next set of winners are our holiday card contest winners. And the first one is Chevy Boney from LC Carr Elementary School. It's not here, beautiful picture. Chloe Coe from Butler Avenue Elementary School. Naomi Salgado from Sunset Avenue School, third grade. Heaven Belcher Eason from Sampson Middle School. And Walker Dixon from Clinton High School. Congratulations to all of our holiday card winners. John, we can move up to our October employees of the month. That'll be fine at this time. Uh, LCK, uh, our um, October employee of the month is, is it Rosalea? Rosa Palencia. Uh, Miss Palencia, better known as Miss Rosa, joined our custodian team at LCK this year and has been a tremendous blessing to our staff and students. Miss Rosa does not hesitate to help wherever there is a need and does so without complaint. She is dependable, dedicated to her work, and takes pride in all that she does. I'm losing mine down here, John. Um, Ms. Rosa has also willingly helped in areas outside of her custodial duties. Our October Student uh, Employee of the Month for LCK, Ms. Rosa Palencia. <laughs> Butler Avenue October Employee of the Month is Ms. Beth Bass. Ms. Bass has taken, has shown great courage preparing BAS for the implementation of our new BURST program. It has taken many extra hours and research to make sure everyone has what is needed to start the program correctly for both first and second grade standards. Ms. Bass has gone above and beyond for the staff at Butler Avenue. She managed all of that while preparing her own groups for reading intervention. Ms. Bass's passion for teaching children to read shows in her daily actions. She does what she can to ensure every child has an opportunity to learn, meet, and exceed growth. Butler Avenue, October Employee of the Month, Ms. Beth Bass. <laughs> Sunset Avenue School, uh, October Employee of the Month, is Ms. Sarah Beth Holland. Ms. Holland has done a great job working with our EC class. We are very fortunate to have her as part of our Sunset Avenue school team. She has truly been a blessing. October Employee of the Month, Ms. Sarah Beth Holland. Uh, October Employee of the Month at Sampson Middle is Mr. Gary Kirby. I'm pleased to announce Mr. Gary Kirby as the October SMS Employee of the Month. Mr. Kirby, goes above and beyond the call of duty for the school, teachers, and students. He is a team player and doesn't mind going the last mile for the calls of his students. Sampson Middle School October Employee of the Month, Mr. Gary Kirby. Clinton High School uh, October Employee of the Month, First Sergeant Aaron Joseph. <laughs> First Sergeant Joseph brings energy and excitement to class every day. He also brings energy to the basketball court. He challenges us to do our best and leads by example. October Employee of the Month, Clinton High School, First Sergeant, retired, Mr. Aaron Joseph. Central Services, you just had the pleasure of hearing from her, is Dr. Teresa Malanis is our October Employee of the Month. Dr. Molinas has come in and hit the ground running. She is a no-nonsense person with a genuine love and focus on students and staff. Dr. Molinas has done a phenomenal job stepping up to the challenge with curriculum and instruction. 
She supports her team and works diligently with schools to ensure they have the resources needed to succeed. She always goes above and beyond. We are fortunate to have such a loyal employee as part of the CCS family. October Employee of the Month Central Services, Dr. Teresa Molinas. And our last group of honorees tonight is our November Employees of the Month. We'll start at LCK again, and we've got Miss Natalie Jackson. Miss Jackson is a dark horse through and through. She tackles each day with a positive attitude and greets every person with a welcoming smile. Miss Jackson has been a wonderful addition to our front office staff as she shares her creativity and new ideas for staff and students alike to enjoy. She is well organized, a great team player, and is willing to help others without hesitation. We are thankful for you, Ms. Jackson, and proud to name you our LCK November Employee of the Month, Ms. Natalie Jackson. <laughs> Butler, Avenue, Butler Avenue Employee of the Month is Ms. April Lewis. Ms. Lewis did an awesome job spearheading our fall festival. Her efforts to secure donations and prizes contributed greatly to the success of the event. While continuing to serve our ML or multilingual students, she worked hard behind the scenes, sending out email reminders to staff, reaching out to local businesses for donations, and organizing the donated prizes. Thanks to her hard work organizing the event, it was a highly successful fundraiser for Butler Avenue. We thank you, Ms. Lewis, Butler Avenue, November Employee of the Month, Ms. April Lewis. Sunset Avenue School Employee of the Month for November is Ms. Shanita Van. Ms. Van always has a positive attitude and makes an effort to greet everyone. Her friendly smile, which we can see, is infectious and brightens my day. I enjoy having a co-worker like Ms. Van, and we need more positive energy like hers. November Employee of the Month for Sunset, Ms. Shanita Van. I think I see one over there. November Sampson Middle School Employee of the Month, Ms. Stacy Simmons. Ms. Simmons is always a positive, calming, and loving presence in our building. That's what I'm hear, I'm hearing that coming from multiple places. She truly loves her students and the staff here at Sampson Middle, and it shows in everything she does. She gives a hundred percent every day we love and appreciate you miss simmons november sampson middle school employee of the month miss stacy simmons <laughs> clinton high school november employee of the month is miss paula barnes miss barnes brings her positive attitude into the school environment every day with a smile on her face she is caring and empathetic towards students and staff her students noted that she respects them and is generous and helpful to them. They also noted that Miss Barnes is always there for them. November Employee of the Month for Clinton High School, Miss Paula Barnes. <laughs> and finally, Central Services Employee of the Month for November is Miss Glenda Estrada. Miss Estrada is a gem. She quietly works in the background, making sure things go smoothly when we have events. Many don't realize how much she also does for our Latino families to help them navigate school, even though this isn't part of her job. Glenda goes above and beyond on a daily basis. She's always willing to help, and she always has a smile on her face, regardless of what she is asked to do. Miss Estrada is always pleasant and helps create an atmosphere of cooperation at the central office. We are grateful to have such a dedicated employee on our team. November Central Service Employee of the Month, Ms. Glenda Estrada. How about one more round of applause and congratulations for all of our recipients tonight. Thank you all for your hard work and your dedication. We appreciate all that you're doing for the Dark Horses, and we look forward to working with you all in the many, many days ahead. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Before everybody leaves, uh, can I have your attention just for a moment? We have one employee that um, is not on the PowerPoint that I'd like to um, 
shout out to um, Mr. Greg Dirks. Greg, come up for a minute. Um, Greg is our new transportation director as, as well as a principal at um, LC Carr School. Uh, we were together early this morning and um, he, he did a phenomenal job. There was a, a bus accident out near my house this morning and uh, very proud of Greg and um, his getting in there and doing what he needed to do, working with the police officers, the EM T's and the fire department. Uh, it was, um, it was, could have been a, a lot worse than it really was, but Greg did a great job representing Clinton City Schools in the interests of our children and, and our employees who were involved in that accident. So I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you, Mr. Dirks. Job well done. <laughs> you deserve it too. Uh, and, and to, um, Reemphasize what Dr. Johnson said. Thank you all for coming and for your support of all of our efforts in Clinton City Schools. It looks like we'll have dark horses for a long time, right? Uh, thank you for those um, participants in the North Carolina School Board Association um, competition. We'll be doing that again next year, I hope. Also, Clinton High School and Samson Middle School sent videos to the competition as well. Last year, the middle school won. Uh, this year we didn't win, but your winners in our heart, right? So we were very proud of, of your participation as well. Again, um, happy holidays to all of you. We have a few more days left before you're going to be out for people nodding their heads <laughs> for, for a couple of weeks. So enjoy family and friends and, and have a great time. Do some celebration. We're going to take a five minute break. Okay. The board's going to take a five minute break before we come back. And again, thank you all.
Nelson. All right, if I could have your attention, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for your patience. Dr. Johnson will finish his, um, edu uh, his information items now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brunson. Again, it was good to acknowledge all of our uh, good news and then to roll right into our recipients of good news for the um, uh, for the last two months. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez did reach out to me in text and said that he has been logged on and listening since 425. So uh, I guess let the record show, uh, as we like to say. I uh, just want to give you some updates. I'm not going to go in depth or at length with a lot of this. Um, uh, it's just kind of some FYIs. So we do, as you all know, we have the partnership with Edenton Chawan. Not going to ask John to uh, click on that link. But that link is actually a concept paper. It's a four-page concept paper that Dr. Sasser and myself worked on. He did 98% of the work. I just looked over it. Uh, but we have a meeting coming up with the Anonymous Trust Group. Uh, and that's been set up by the North Carolina Public School Forum. Um, and as you know, well, as you, I think you know, I think we've shared this, but uh, what the partnership is about is that all teachers have access, all, all students have access to quality teachers. And you all know that Sabrina Reeves is teaching, initially she was teaching one of their classes, now she's actually teaching third and fourth block. Um, uh, it, well, math four, I almost said advanced math, but it's math four. Um, I believe she's also, they are actually, um, and, and they do it at the same time that we teach our kids. It's not during a planning. So our kids are in there and we're basically uh, um, sh sending out the instruction uh, that's going on in the classroom to Edenton Chawan in real time. That's why this is a great partnership and it's much different than something like North Carolina virtual public schools. Uh, it's in real time. They can ask questions. Uh, they, that we did have a meeting recently. Dr. Molinas was part of that meeting. Uh, Sabrina was part of that meeting. Sheila was part of that meeting where we talked about things that we can enhance. And we talked about uh, grouping students where students face to face would be grouped with students from uh, Edenton Chawan and they could work together on projects and different things. And so really good partnership, but uh, it's not a cheap partnership. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're looking for is a funding partner once ESSER funds run out. And that's what this meeting with Anonymous Trust is for. So we have a meeting on December the 15th at 3.30. It's a Zoom meeting. Uh, Sabrina will be a part of that meeting. Uh, I'll be a part of that meeting. I'll probably ask uh, Dr. Molinas to be a part. But we're going to be talking with our partners from Edenton Chawan and uh, the Anonymous Trust to look for a funding partner because we only see this model growing. Uh, with uh, having uh, access to quality teachers, it's going to become, we feel, more and more difficult to find teachers. As you may or may not know, if you've looked at your personnel agenda, I'm sure you have, we still have a vacancy right now in, uh, for a math teacher and an English teacher at the high school. Uh, and they're having these same issues times six or eight. Uh, and then my buddy and uh, Bertie, uh, very difficult time finding uh, teachers. So we are we are kind of forming this partnership. We've got two other LEAs that are inter or PSUs they're now called that are interested in this partnership and uh, working with the anonymous trust to be a funding uh, source for that. Dr. Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Is this similar to um, what they're doing in Cumberland County? I know a few years ago we were speaking about um, Cumberland offering coursework that we didn't have and attempting to um, allow our students to be able to do this very same thing through Cumberland County. So is this a very similar program and, and would uh, Cumberland be one of the LE PSUs that you're referencing? Uh, that's a great question. I have no knowledge of Cumberland County and what they're what they're doing there. Uh, I can tell you that everybody feels like what we're doing is state of the art. Uh, so I would say no, but I'm not positive on that. Uh, I think I think what's the big change potentially, uh, Miss Worley, is that this is in real time. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and uh, so I'm not aware of what Cumberland was doing. If they were doing it, they're not doing it, not doing it anymore. Okay. Thank you. I think what Cumberland was doing was allowing certain teachers to teach teach remotely from home to to students that did not want to go back to face to face. I think that's what they were doing. That's not what I'm referencing. This is uh, pre-COVID times. Is what I'm referencing. Um, yes, they were. They were actually. Sorry, Miss Worley, I didn't mean to interrupt you. They were actually having some of their schools had more AP teachers than others, and some with different course offerings than others, and they were extending their teachers at those schools that had a particular AP course or a, an advanced physics course, and then synchronously allowing students from other schools to attend that class. Um, we reached out to them several years ago, Miss Worley. I remember our board talking about it, and they just they didn't seem very uh, willing to involve any other PSUs. So I think Dr. Johnson is correct. This is one of the first partnerships lately where two public school units are cooperating together to do synchronous live instruction. Thank now, you, I John. This, I know this is beginning stages. But would there be any issues if their classes, our classes, cross work? Uh, would everything be through like Google Docs or something? So there's no, there's no, if they have a certain program or we have a certain program that we all don't have to buy the same, the same, every, everything would go through Google yeah. Docs then. Luckily, right, right now, um, Eden and Chuan School is a Google Enterprise for Education school. So they have access to Google Meet. Um, I worked through with um, some of our partners at DPI to make sure that school net assessments were accessible to both school systems. And there's a way that even even when there was a partner teacher, initially we had a retired teacher at Eden Chuan who was the partner. Um, that teacher has since decided that coming out of retirement was not the best path for them and they've gone to other things, but they were actually in school net and, and our teacher, Ms. Reeves, and that teacher could collaborate on even building the assessment, which was interesting. Um, we've been demoing some enhanced tech of VB 130 from AVER. Um, was in Miss Reeves' room. It's still there, actually. It's just been unplugged. And we've now put um, the meeting aisle unit because that was one of the things Dr. Sasser wanted to see us to enhance is get a 360 degree view over the room. And this new tech called Meeting Aisle is a 360 degree camera that has artificial intelligence that will focus on whoever is speaking. Some of you experienced that in our last virtual board meeting. We were using it in conference room C. So it's now in the hands of Ms. Reeves to demo in that classroom. And we're thinking that's going to be our our technological platform and a solution there. But yeah, we're uh, luckily we're working through those challenges. Um, if we find a PSU that wants to partner that doesn't pay for the Google Enterprise for Education version, there's always the free option for them to join and become um, a Google free education institution so we could still collaborate that way. And I don't want to get the cart before the horse, but with uh, internet services, well, if this takes off and we have 10 classes going on at the high school or at the middle school, will, will we be able to handle that live streaming or the capabilities be able to take? Cause I don't want to do anything. I don't want to start something. If, if we can't look in the future and say, Hey, this is where it's going. Like you just said, Dr. J, if this is where this is going, we need to make sure we're getting infrastructure in yeah. place now instead of trying to catch up. Yeah, we're good. I've worked hard to, as best you can in tech, to future-proof our network capabilities. And we have fiber from every school back to our operations center at 10 gig. And we're only using like 3% of it at any given time. So we have plenty of what in tech terms they'll call backhaul. Um, the other thing is if we are doing more high-definition streaming, it will increase our bandwidth usage, but because schools across the state are through the North Carolina Research and Education Network managed by MCNC, when they see the bandwidth reach a certain level, 
they, they'll come in and change out your main router and double your capacity once you reach a threshold. And that's for any PSU in the state. So I, I don't foresee any technical limitations except, you know, we may, you know, partner with the anonymous trust to put these meeting aisles in every room where we partner with. And they're approximately $1,100 each. So they're not outrageous, but they're great technology for this purpose. Yeah, and so it, absolutely. I, and I, I think all the, the, the questions and also the uh, comments and uh, we're really excited about this um, and the potential partnership that it can bring. Uh, I know Ms. Worley asked about other PSUs. I know Perquimans is one. Um, I am trying to lean heavily on my previous experience with Ethan Linker uh and bring pit into the equation uh, actually ethan's talked to me last week about this partnership and he is really upset that he wasn't the first one to do it uh because he said he's been talking about it for about four or five years but but his tech um person was kind of against it G joining with other part joining with other psus uh because it there is lots of things you have to consider, like the money side of things. And uh, and so if we can get a good if we can get a good partner like the Anonymous Trust uh, who can help with the things that John's talking about. But right now, we don't have anything coming out of our pocket except for the technology, like the meeting aisles and those things. Uh, Edenton Chawan is putting forth the money to pay Miss Reeves the extra money. Um, but we would be in the similar way. Uh, but if you could get a bigger partner like Pitt that is already doing this, like jo like John and mentioned that Cumberland was doing, Pitt does exactly what John was talking about. They live stream their classes from one high school to the next where they might not have uh, a physics teacher or they may not have this other type of teacher. So they've been doing this for years. But the difference between what Cumberland and what Pitt well, what Cumberland was and what Pitt is, is this is a partnership amongst districts. And so Ethan told me, he actually asked me about it last week and said, we want to be a partner. And so I put him in touch with uh, Michael, Dr. Sasser, and uh, we're going to try to bring him into the equation because then you've just gained a lot of different teachers and a lot, uh, and you've diversified what you're able to offer, uh, you, know, to, you know, to your students. So that's what we're working on. Could that potentially open up some things through ECU if you get Pitt involved? Well, I would think so. Uh, you know, East Carolina's got a great instructional technology department. Uh, many of our people who get master's degree in instructional technology come from East Carolina. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I, I would assume so. But but the bigger the bigger reason. It's just because of uh, they're a larger the size yeah, 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 the larger PSU, and they have access to all those teachers that we just don't have, and Perquimans, and yeah, and then then they have a huge um, um, former, uh, I think they call it retired teachers association, is real big in Pitt. Uh, so that would just give us access to a lot of resources, and uh, and then again, you know, Dr. Linker and I have just you know, he's my former boss and we're pretty good friends. So um, we're working on this, working on this. Uh, but the meeting is with the anonymous trust and that would, that would definitely help us. Um, that's next December 15th. Project Uplift. I know you've heard about this enough. I just keep bringing it to you because we're still in need of staff members. And I always, when I got the mic, I want to say we need staff for Project Uplift. Uh, we have found uh one solid staff member that is definite. We found a couple more that will be meeting with Mr. Faison or may have already met with him this week in regards to the, I think we're going to have the staff. So now I'm going to be working with uh, Principal Brown and finding the students and we're hoping to start in January. So just an up, just, just an update on Project Uplift. Uh, the next one, we could probably spend an hour. We're not going to do that. What I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, and I know some of you are remote. Uh, I have got several things from NCDPI. And when I say things, this could really, several of the things that are going on right now with DPI uh, that will 
occur also with our legislators in the long session. We're talking about fundamental changes to the way we do education. Um, and I don't want to not spend the time uh, or share these things. So I'm going to ask you to look at all these items, uh, come back to me with questions uh, that I can share. Um, because, you know, at one time where I was probably the low man on the totem pole, <laughs> Uh, that's quickly changing just because the vast number of superintendents that are retiring. Um, I'd say now I'm on the probably the plus side of the 50 percent who have the mo most years of experience. Um, it, it, it is a little I know what you're going to say, but uh, yeah. Um, so um, we actually had a meeting today with DPI. And uh, me and Michael Marr, who is now one of their deputy superintendents, we're on a first name basis uh, because we talked exclusively exclusively about uh, performance, uh, the performance grade redesign. And I worked with the C superintendents, me and Charles Faust, to kind of put our, uh, our portfolio together with what we wanted to present uh, to Dr. Marr today. But uh, so things like the report card, that's just an FYI. The SC School Report Card should be released very soon. Uh, Dr. Um, Ms. Kimbrough and Dr. Molinas are working on our data. Everything looks good. So we'll let you know when that goes live. Salary and code adjustments. I don't even want to talk about that tonight because I'm not even sure I understand it. Uh, but we can uh, get some information for you. It's there for you. Basically, what you need to know is that in the previous way we did salary codes, and uh, this is only for classified employees and i know dr brunson would know a lot about this there may be 75 pay pay codes and 75 you, you would start at like a 59 and you could go to a 64 and then there's within that there's like 60 different levels they have drastically streamlined that uh, and so all of that is in that um, hyperlink where it says suggested salary and code adjustments. We did look at it uh, in cabinet this 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 Monday, but none of us, I think, feel um, well versed enough to talk about it. But I want you to look at it, see if you've got questions, get them to me and then we'll find out. Uh, but lots and lots of changes and potentially could mean salary adjustments for a lot of individuals as well. Uh, so we can talk about all that when those new, um, when you have time to peruse that. Um, everything is like uh, redlined if it's, it's, if it's been marked out and they're uh, adding something or proposing to bring in something new. Again, all classified stuff. Um, field test, uh, uh, field test teacher licensure. So all this is the Pepsi stuff. That we've talked about several times where they were going to pay teachers and a bunch of, of additional money uh they were gonna uh you could go up the different licensure uh ranges to like a range six pathways, pathways to excellence is what it's called so what the state has done with that now is not it's not a definite they've given uh and this is an article that john's pulling up they've given the state superintendent some things to bring back i believe by march uh, she has to report on a few things, and it appears that they're going to do this as a pilot. Um, so what we've been talking about, and I've shared all that with you, I've shared it with several of, of my staffs at the school, it does appear this is going to be a pilot. They did mention in an article, this may or may not be the article that John's got up, that there is already 15 systems that already have advanced teacher roles. So they didn't say that they will be the pilots, but it probably makes sense that they would be. Pitt is one of those. Pitt is one of those. Um, and there's some smaller ones like Lexington City. It has advanced teacher roles. Uh, and so um, what it looks like is it's going to be a pilot. Uh, so there's an article in that uh, on that one as well. Um, then I, I just I just linked the whole winter superintendent quarterly meeting. So we had a meeting with uh, Catherine Truitt, uh, and a lot of times these maybe last an hour. I was pretty impressed, uh, although I, I did uh, 
get taxed and waned a little bit after, but that was a three and a half hour meeting where Catherine Truett and her team discussed a lot of the changes that we're talking about right now. So look through that hundred and some page uh, slideshow deck there. That's why I'm telling you, I'm not going through it tonight, but let me know what questions you have. There'll be things in there on the, um, the, the uh, school performance grade redesign. Uh, there's all kinds of things in there that you just look through. Let me know what questions you have, and I'll be happy to address those. Uh, what it looks like and appears like now is we were all uh, concerned that they were just going to roll this school performance design out. It looks like it's going to be piloted. That's the, that's the key word they're using now. Um, and another key word they're using is there'll be required indicators. Let me give you an example. Like your four-year graduation rate will be a required uh, indicator. Your EOC and EOG performance will be a required indicator. But there'll also be choice indicators. We were real big. We put this in, we put this in our model. Uh, but they had already discussed that. There'll be uh, choice models where the districts will get to choose some additional items that they can choose from. There might be, I don't know what the number, let's say five or seven, and the, di and the district would choose three to four that you would be responsible for. Some of the ones that were mentioned today as possible choice models would be things such as student attendance or absenteeism, teacher effectiveness profiles, school safety, school environment cleanliness, extracurricular activities. Uh, and so, you know, you, the, the district would choose, you couldn't choose the four-year graduation rate. That's going to be in there. You can't choose EOC and EOG performance. You can't choose growth. Uh, but some of the ones you could choose, and I can tell you, I would choose it if I was a superintendent, extracurricular activities because y'all can imagine just the sheer numbers of students we have in our district that participate that don't mean just sports that means in all the extracurricular activities uh, take student surveys out of, of the student surveys was mentioned and talked about a lot today and that would potentially be one of the choice uh groups a lot of these that that, that you've heard about are being linked in and uh put up under certain new names like they said like the word you, you've probably heard this one durable skills this is the direct quote today very pop very popular however hard to measure consistently across the state it could become a choice for districts one of the ones that has strong opinion from a lot of uh, people is innovative teaching and learning practice we were told today that's probably coming out not going to be required. It could be a choice, but how is that vi valid and reliable? But one of the things that Michael is really pushing hard is I've never heard a researcher or anybody say this from DPI. Many of the things that we're talking about measuring is outside the locus of control of the district. And if it's outside the locus of control, we're not putting it in there um, because it's outside of your control. And so it was, it was, there was a strong argument that today is student attendance outside the locus of control of a district. Uh, and so again, lots of that stuff's in there. Y'all look at that and just let me know what you want me to push. And, and cause I'm, I'm put, I've told my staff, they know I'm pushing this school accountability stuff hard because there has to be adjustments when 43% of all schools in North Carolina are low performing. That makes no sense. Um, then you've got some athletic updates. I always have the athletic updates in here. A couple of big ones uh, happened at the uh, winter meeting uh, for the North Carolina High School Athletic Association. One of these directly affects us. East Bladen petitioned the state well, position the North Carolina High School Athletic Association to be put back in 1A, and it was granted. They were one of the only few that it was granted. Here's why it was granted. They had already reached out to a conference. They had already reached out to all the schools. All the schools wanted to add them into the conference. They had numbers to prove that they really should be a 1A school. So in 2023-24, East Bladen, will be returning to 1A. What does that do for us? 
what well, takes the SAC 7 conference down to the SAC 6. And then some of those schools, most all of them, don't have tennis. That would be like one sport. It's few, very few of them have tennis. Fairmont, Fairmont doesn't do soccer. None of them have golf. So um, our athletic director has wrote a very um, poignant email to the High School Athletic Association saying we need to be removed from the SAC 7 conference. I think it needs to be disbanded, number one, because it just makes no sense for us to have to drive now. Now we have to drive by East Bladen to go to West Bladen to go to Robinson County. Um, and so you've just lost one of your – probably your key that would bring you in some, um, some local, revenues. Local rivalry. Yeah. You have. And so you've lost one of your key local rivals. And now you're playing West Bladen, Fairmont. I mean, yeah, Midway's still in the conference, but uh, yeah, you know, we'll see. Um, second thing that happened there that was a big change that will, that will affect us locally, especially local in dollars. And I support this. I'm just bringing it to you. There was a passage of a 10% increase for all officials beginning January the 1st. Not only was it a 10% increase, but there was also the elimination of the double header game fee. What does that mean? Schools got a reduction in having to pay officials. If me, if John, myself, and Teresa worked a basketball game, we only made $105 instead of the money we should have made by working both games. Since they, since they reduced that, the $105 is now $152. So last week, we had three home basketball games. It's always, always, the official of the girls' game is the official of the boys' game. That's going to cost you 152 times three, which is, what, 456 uh, times three days. Now you're looking at $1,400 just to pay your officials. Uh, so, again, that's great. It's wonderful. But we need more fans in the stand uh, to have to pay our officials. But that's for every sport beginning January the 1st. Speaking of that, I want to thank the board tonight as part of the consent agenda. Uh, we were able to raise our coaching pay uh, for our uh, coaches in Clinton City Schools, 10% for all coaches uh, at um, – for all grades of levels one through five with 15 years of experience or more. So I appreciate our board tonight for your work on, on, on that. And I uh, appreciate uh, Emily who's not here for her work on getting that data to our board. What, what they probably won't do anything about the conference, but Yeah. Most likely. If, yeah. if you if you recall, when they put us in this conference, there was multiple phone calls, multiple letters, and lack of a better word, they just don't like Clinton. And they ain't going to do nothing to help us out. So, the three more years of this. The exact quote, uh, Mr. Edgerton, was somebody has to play them. That was what I was told. Somebody has to play them. Um, anyway, the, the other, the other small changes, background checks will be required for media outlets. Yeah, that should have been done the whole time. They're going to look at a, uh, a group to study the endowment funds. They've approved the calendars for football next year. They've expanded the tennis playoffs, uh, for 2A. It's now going from 32 to 48 teams, uh, for those of us that are, uh, that, uh, that may be parents uh, of uh, tennis players. Uh, there's some different language in there in regards to volleyball. But I've got all those changes in there for you to look at. We do have an updated basketball schedule. I think we added Wallace Rose Hill was the only change. I've got that for you there. It says updated basketball. Uh, and then a whole lot of upcoming events. Uh, there's several that I could highlight, but we've got uh, we've got the Christmas. Um, concert on Thursday night. 
Uh, we've got Christmas Parade Saturday. The board Christmas dinner is Monday. We've got Fall Athletic Awards uh, Tuesday uh, of next week. So just look at all these. The last thing I want to highlight, John, if you go to the last page at the very top, we do have a mandatory work day. Uh, John, his team, and the executive cabinet are working on a schedule for that day. But one of the things that I wanted to let you all know, I mentioned it to you, I have talked with Attorney Williams. She will be on site in the afternoon to lead a group of principals uh, in uh, Title IX. That says Title IV. Should be, say Title IX and personnel law. And then after the principals, the cabinet and the Board of Education will have a uh, PD session led by Attorney Williams. That's Monday, February 20th. Title IX, not Title IV. <laughs> We could get Dr. Van to tell us about Title IV, uh, but uh, Title IX and personnel law will be uh, Miss uh, Attorney Williams on that Monday, February the 20th. That's all the items I have, unless you have questions. Questions for Dr. Johnson from the board. There's a lot of information, a lot of new things coming down the pike. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you, Dr. Johnson. And, and some of this, you'll have to keep us informed and give us the Cliff Notes version yeah. whenever you get an opportunity. It's a lot. It's a lot to keep up with. A lot of changes happening in the state. Um, next item on the agenda is Board of Ed items. Um, we have a video subscription to the North Carolina School Board Association. If you um, want to do some staff development, I see that we won some awards or an award for our professional development, um, uh, things that we've done in the past. Gold Bell. Yeah, the Gold Bell Award, yes. And some individual recognition. So if you want to um, participate, uh, and most of them, those, all of those are online, get in touch with uh, Ms. Hayes and she can help you get registered and for those. But that, there is no additional fee we've already paid the subscription okay last item in the board section is the board resolution we heard from our cte director today and, and several others about um things that we're doing in uh, concert with the community college so this resolution um is uh speaking to the calendar issue that we want our calendar to coincide with Sampson Community College so it would give our students more opportunities uh, to succeed, graduate with credentials and college credits and those type of things. Any questions about the resolution before I ask for a vote? No questions. Um, I need a motion to approve the resolution as it is presented. I made that motion, Madam Chair. Motion made by um, Pastor Emanuel. Can I get a second? Second. Second, Madam Chair. <laughs> I think Mr. Edgerton got in first that time. Second by Mr. Edgerton. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by the word aye. Aye. Motion carried. Aye. Thank you very much. Um, any other mm -hmm. items from the board? I just want to adjourn? say the morning crowd when it's summertime, it's hot, drop off, pick up. But when it's cold, it's cold. And I just want to say, they've always got a smiling face on. It's easy to smile when it's hot outside. It's hard to smile when it's cold. And they have, they are so happy in the morning when we drop kids off. I just want to tell them all, thank you. Kudos to the morning drop off people. Thank you so much for what you do. Madam Chair, I do have one thing for our uh, two board members that are virtual. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, arrangement uh, for you. I, I will get that to you uh, with the help of my wonderful staff. They'll remind me uh, to get that to you uh, Monday night uh, for Dr. Rodriguez and Miss Worley. Uh, it's a beautiful arrangement uh, that we would like to present to you for all your hard work and dedication to our faculty, staff, students, and community here in Clinton City Schools. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It Thank is you. beautiful. It's, it's beautiful. Got a nice blanket in there, Carol and Oscar. Sorry, we're gonna give you all. Some <laughs> we're, we're open yours in your absence, okay? <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, and, and um, thank you to Dr. Johnson, and his staff for their hard work. Uh, we we appreciate it. We really do. 
Um, if nothing else claims the board's attention at this time, I'll need a motion to adjourn the December 6th meeting. Madam Chair, I, I would like to say thank you too um, on behalf of the board as well. Thank you. Uh, wonderful looking stuff. Merry Christmas to all of you. And I make a motion we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Doctor, I mean, Pastor Emmanuel made a motion that we adjourn, and Mr. Edgerton jumped right in and got that second in. All in favor, let it be known by the word I. Uh, Aye. Stay safe, dark horse strong. Thank you all. We'll see you, uh, if not before, on Monday at six and go.